Welcome to Manifold. Today, my guest is Paul Huang. He is a research fellow at the Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation. He is also a journalist who covers East Asia and Taiwan. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Hello, everyone. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, you are actually in Tokyo right now. Is that correct? Ah,、uh, yes. But you're you're based in Gaoshan. Taipei, actually. I'm from Gaoshan, but I live in Taipei、uh, most of the time. Got it. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation. Sure, we are a public opinion polling research organization. We are independent. We don't belong to the government nor any political party, nor、uh, we pay by any political party or politicians. And we are considered one of the several, if not one of the few, independent non-partisan polling data point that's coming from Taiwan. Great. That's the main reason I invited you on the podcast because I really wanted to expose my mostly American and Western listeners to some information about how ordinary Taiwanese feel about current situation across the Taiwan Strait. Right. Let me start though by asking you about your background. Now in Taiwan, so for example, my relatives in Taiwan came to the island in 1949 after the nationalists. Lost a civil war, and、right. so for a long time the Taiwanese politics was dominated by those members of the Kuomintang or KMT、uh, political party. Do you trace your family history back to the mainland? Personally, my family they are from Gaoshan. My my on my father's side, and they're considered the the non mainlanders, which means they were already there before nineteen forty nine. So we are, and we speak. We speak the Thai, the the Fujian, the the the, the what they, what they call Taiwanese, which is really the Fujian dialect of the of the Chinese. So we are not. We consider Ben Ben Shen Ren the Taiwan to just translate as Taiwanese, but that's not really the, a good translation. Yes. So for my listeners, there was a much larger pre-existing population of Chinese that had mostly come from Fujian Province and had been、mm-hmm. on the island of Taiwan many hundreds of years before the nationalist government moved from China at the end of the Civil War in 1949 to Taiwan. And a lot of the divergence in public opinion about relationship with China, possible reunification in the future, splits along. These lines, depending on whether you're, you come from a KMT family or not a KMT family, is is that fair, Paul? Yes. Well, that that's that's used to be the case. However, the in recent year, in recent the last decade,、uh, we're starting to see that that see that your、um, mainlanders or non-mainlanders that as that identity is playing. A little bit less rural these days. It's still the case among the older constituents, older people, especially those above sixty-five something. But in the, among the younger people, it's no longer is is less of a factor now. Good. Now, let me try to tease out in some detail, maybe the worldview of a typical Green Party voter. And the worldview of a typical blue or KMT party voter, and in fact, now I guess for this coming election there are going to be three parties involved, but we'll, we'll get into that later.、Um, for my listeners, the Green Party has been typically characterized as pro-independence and has a bit more of a base in、uh, Taiwanese that have maybe a longer history on the island. Would you say a typical Green Party voter really sees Taiwan as a kind of separate entity from the People's Republic of China and finds it very the, the idea extremely alien of any possible reunification in the future? Is is that fair, or am I sort of distorting the typical worldview? Both the 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 Pan Green Pan Green's camp. Support the supporters of the Penguin Camp, which means the DDP, 
and the other few smaller party, and also the pen group Blue Camp, the KMT. I would say the majority, vast majority of Taiwanese,、uh, blue or the green, they really don't see themselves as the same as the, the Chinese on the on the mainland. It's just an identity thing. Now they they with on Taiwan's、uh, future political arrangements and also national identity, right? And there might be different answer, but in general, they there is just. A sense of uniqueness, a sense of difference, being different among the Taiwanese compared to China. So that they don't, they don't really see themselves as a sense as the, the, the Chinese on the mainland. In fact, if I would say, if I would describe it, I would say they they feel they are superior than the the other side, and that's both among the 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 the, the, the green and the blue. That's interesting. So. Is the superiority based in more advanced economic development or more advanced cultural development? What? Why do they see themselves as superior to the mainlanders? Oh yeah, well they, because historically in the in the eighties and nineties, that China was poor, right? When when the Chi when the Taiwanese they went they 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 went there to to, to start business to do investments. They 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 saw. China everywhere basically at the time it's like just poor, just undeveloped, and they see the mainlanders as much poorer, much less sophisticated than than they were, and and that, that this has this impression, this idea, this is where they I think is where their superiority came from, and still the case today. Even so, the underlying Fundamentals have changed. The, the Chinese on the, the on the mainland, a lot of you, there's a lot of wealth, a lot of even more developed places in Taiwan, in China these days. But this, but in Taiwan, this superiority, sense of superiority has stayed the same, and that 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 is, I think, is partially propelling the the partisan narrative these days, especially on the the the. the Pro the the pan green, the DPP supporters side. What fraction of adult Taiwanese do you think have either traveled in China themselves, or at least have a realistic view of what life is like in mainland China? Well, we know at any point of time that there are like half a million to one million, or even more Taiwanese on mainland. Like right now, now that they're doing business, they're working there, they are studying or just living there as retirees. Many of them retire there.、So. But <clears throat> the my observation is, the Taiwanese that have this exposure to China, they have lived there, they have seen things there, they have observed in first first hand what development, what situation is like over there. Right when they come back to Taiwan, they can't say this out loud because it's not considered politically correct to say, "Well, China is maybe more wealthy, more developed than we are now." This is just not a thing that you 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 hear politicians saying in Taiwan. This is not considered politically correct. Then people don't like it if you say that in Taiwan. Yeah, I'm a little bit curious about that because I've spent time both in in both places and. You know, it's funny. I never had a Taiwanese person get mad at me for saying this, maybe, and maybe I was mostly talking to expats or ABCs、mm -hmm. or kind of very sophisticated people. But it seemed to me, as somebody who had been traveling to Taipei for ten or fifteen years easily, that Taipei, the development sort of slowed down. My suspicion was it was because a lot of the entrepreneurial energy was in China. A lot of Taiwanese entrepreneurs were working in China, and not so much. You know, investing their energy in、mm -hmm. Taiwan proper, and so it seemed to me that the first tier cities in China had surpassed Taipei a long time ago. And I would often remark this to people who were familiar both with, say, Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen and Taipei, and nobody ever contradicted me. But I could, I could guess that if you just said this to a regular Taiwanese person, they might be offended. Some, some, yes, there, there. In general, of course, if if you run for politics in Taiwan, 
It's kind of like in the U.S., right? You say things that people wanted to hear, like what was the TSMC is the greatest company in the world, that everyone else needs our chip to survive. The world needs our chip to keep going, and and so we are indispensable. And therefore, there's nothing that can stop us. There's nothing that can harm us, right? This is the kind of thing that you heard from Taiwan politicians, especially on the DPP side. Just this pride, this these sense of superiority, right? And then this is used to mask real policy deficiencies and issues in the country. And I'm sorry to say, but this is this is a problem in Taiwan now that that people are stuck in the past glory, and they 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 can't focus on the issues that we have. So, in the United States, you know, politicians will often say things that you know, at least half of the U.S. population, you know, completely disagree with. I wonder how many. I mean, that, this is why I asked the question about how many Taiwanese, just ordinary Taiwanese are familiar with the situation on the mainland or the level of development of the, of the mainland, because I understand the, the politicians have to say these things, but the question is how many people actually believe them when they say these things? Well, I think that quite a percentage, well, at least, at, at least more than half, right? They really just haven't been following up. The, 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 the development, the situation in China. And I, I say this as from a defense and security perspective, that, that most Taiwanese, they don't, they're not aware of the rapid changes, and they, they build up the modernizations that China's its military, its intelligence gathering, its technological advances have been. And this this is not just on the DPP side, but on the the KMT side as well. And this is becoming a problem. This is, there is a perception gap between what people think the reality is and versus what it actually is. Yes. I want to come back to the military, uh, you know, a realistic assessment of the military situation in just a minute. But mm-hmm. if you don't mind, let's stick for a moment just uh, with the perceptions of the people uh, on other matters. So... Yeah. Let me ask you the following. From the American perspective, if you listen to the U.S., the sort of standard narrative in the U.S., the idea is that China is a kind of totalitarian dictatorship, or at least, you know, the most polite thing that an American would say it's an, is that it's an authoritarian state. And I think most Americans think that the difference between, say, living in Hong Kong 10 years ago and living in China or living in Taiwan currently and living in China, that there are enormous differences in the amount of personal freedom you have or just just the kind of feeling that people have living in the two different political situations. Now, my, my feeling is because there's so many Taiwanese living in China and just happily doing business in China and vice versa, that from a day to day perspective, the difference is not felt very strongly. I'm curious what you think is the actual perception of the average Taiwanese person about this. Oh, yeah, definitely. They're, they're proud of Taiwan's political system. They're giving them freedom of speech, right? freedom of association, and also that where they can elect their political leaders, their politicians. This is what, this is considered like a, Across the partisan line, consensus that Taiwan system is what we wanted, we, we, we wanted to be. That's what we wanted to keep. I think this is a majority opinion. Of course, the question is <laughs> that there are just serious security defense challenges that Taiwan faces. And the, 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 the politicians that are late don't, they, they, they can't seem to find good solutions to, to the, to the issues that we have. Does any, in the public discourse, does anybody talk about what it would be like if somehow Taiwan someday, maybe decades in the future, were to be reunified with China? Is it something people even speculate about how that would work? Among the major party and politicians, they don't talk about this because it's not popular. 
it's, it's not going to get your vote, of course. And among the media, of course, this is not something that people talk about because it's considered it's one of those politically incorrect topics. Oh, well, China takes over and then what, what next? Right? It's, it's, people assume that that wouldn't happen. So, you know, I, I find it, I, I mean, I, I agree with your perception based on the time I spent in Taiwan that, that just this topic is just generally not discussed, which I find kind of amazing because, for example, I think if you lived in Ukraine or something a few years ago, you would probably think a lot about what it would be like if your oblast were taken over by Russians or not taken over by Russians. People would think a lot about the differences, like what what, what the practical differences of the two situations would be since since it's a real possibility. Right. And since last year's Ukraine war, Taiwan's media and politicians, they talk a lot about Ukraine because they saw the, the relative success that Ukraine had in resisting Russians' invasion. And then it, the, that's all the story now these days. It's like, oh, Ukraine did this, right? Ukraine beat, they, 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 they beat a, lo- a much larger, more resourceful Russia. Therefore, what, what, what is it to fear about China's military, right? And you see all these false equivalent, these quite delusional thinking, not just in, in the media, not just in public opinion, uh, but in Taiwan's government, in its military. They're saying that, oh, the Ukraine did that, so we can do this. <laughs> There's is, not- there, is there any sort of realistic voice pointing out that you know, the economy of Ukraine is totally destroyed and a huge fraction of the people have fled the country and are probably oh, yeah. not that that's also not mentioned within Taiwan's within these in, in this wishful thinking. Right? They're just they're just like talking about the glory that Ukraine had. Oh, that's how many tanks, how many how many so Russians they they, they kill. Okay. It's just, how many Ukraine Ukrainians have fled the country? The, what percentage of Ukraine has been rendered robbers and wasteland? If you don't t- if you don't talk about that, then how can you compare yourself to Ukraine? But so it sounds like this is the the party line and maybe even the corporate media narrative. But do ordinary people appreciate how much hardship the ordinary Ukrainian has been put through in the last year? Uh no, they don't. You, that's that's something that you don't see in the media. It's something you don't see in the the the, the common people. They they wouldn't they wouldn't read or heard like how many Ukrainians have fled, how many cities, how many places have been destroyed, right? That, that, that's just not talk about. And then I don't think people in Taiwan they understood just how much how bloody how heavy a price that Ukraine has paid. So if, if you as a journalist wanted to write an article about the kind of realistic mm-hmm. military situation uh, in Taiwan and also realist, realistic take on what had actually happened in the last year in Ukraine, could you find experts in Taiwan that are willing to speak about these things realistically on the record? Yeah, of course. Within the defense and security and analysis circle that uh, we know, of course, there are several, there, there are quite a several people, Taiwanese, that uh, voices and observers that are not willing to look at things from an objective perspective, just saying it for what it is. But of course, that's within our circle of the of security defense watchers. And I don't think the people, this is not a popular nor visible, visible discussion in the public sphere. I see. So it, it there are people who are aware of these things and think think these thoughts, but they're they're not broadcast to the general population. Yes. So so the this this is what we call the end game scenario. A end of war scenario. Right? Uh, in Zhong, uh, in Chinese we call the uh, uh, Zhong Zhan Zhi Dao. It means that what, what will happen after a war, what are we going to do after a war? Meaning that, well, if the war doesn't go the way, doesn't go the way that we want it, 
Like if China destroy our our air force and navy and our missile forces, well, what are we gonna do? We just keep fighting with nothing. You have no, you have no air force, no no navy. Your your command controls destroy, right? And the next, if you don't surrender, the next thing is POA is gonna land on Taiwan. And it's gonna be a a bloody ground battle, or and turn Taiwan into rubble. And so so this this idea of uh, of the uh, end of war. Discussion, right? To what extent Taiwan should fight to resist until you surrender, right? Th- this, this is not being discussed within outside of very small, very secure defense analysts and commentators. Outside of this, this is considered a taboo, right? Because you can't just say. Why we? Why if we lose, right? You, you can't. You can't say that. You, you, if like a mainstream politicians or media, if they if they say this, they will be accused of you are defeatist. You are you are Chinese spy. You're Chinese agent, right? You're not allowed to talk about this. To what extent should we? To what extent is below like like after which we should surrender? This is not talk about. It's interesting. I mean, you know. Even if you don't lose, say you put up a good fight and the 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 the, you know, the conflict takes place over a long period of time, still the, the the outcome could still be really terrible. I mean, the economy could be destroyed, and you know, fuel blockade and no energy in Taiwan, or even maybe not even enough food in Taiwan. So, I think even if you don't assume that you're going to lose, I think just having to fight that war would be really terrible for most of the population. Yes, if you look at the history, no no country, no nation, ever actually fought till the last man or woman. It just never happened. Usually, you surrender, you capitulate, at at a threshold of say something like twenty to thirty percent. After you lose twenty to thirty percent of your population, you're gonna surrender. This is just what's going to happen, right? There's like no matter how brave, how how ferociously you 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 think you are that you're just going to your country your nation your your tribe is going it's not going to fight out know, the very last person right and it's, uh, you look at the history like it's like imperial Japan in World War Two right all their major cities were burned to the ground they, the, the millions of civilian died in the fire bombing and and the Tommy bombing and they surrender. That's Japan. That's that's like we're talking about a, a militarist uh, society at, at that point. They surrender, so, as well as uh, any other cases in history. But this is not something that Taiwan, uh, in Taiwan's defense, that people talk about. Okay, at what threshold, at what level, should we continue fighting? Should we continue resisting? No, right. there's no discussion. You're not allowed to talk about that. Right. right, but as a military analyst, I will say this: that I, that even so, I don't, I'm not allowed to talk about right. As they, at what level of destructions or military defeat should Taiwan surrender? What I can say is, as what percentage, at, at, at what level that the political leadership of Taiwan will likely capitulate. I mean, this is just objective analysis. And th- this is what's what my the basis of a lot of my takes on Taiwan's military. That I think that threshold, that that level of capitulation, is actually much easier to achieve you know, from Chinese perspective than what people realize. So okay, let let's get into that in just a moment. Yeah. But before we leave this topic, I right. I just want to understand. So there is a taboo, people don't want to talk realistically about yes. what a conflict would be like. They don't want to talk realistically about what is actually happening in Ukraine. Yes. I think you suggested that even you would not be able to point out certain things. So would you actually face direct censorship or how would that actually be directed against you if you if you wanted to talk more realistically? Yeah. Well, if I write an article saying, in, in Chinese, publishing in Taiwan, if I say, if we lose all our fighter jets, if, if, if we lose all our navy, right? If we lose, say, 20% of our army, 
and that is like that is like three uh thirty thousand forty thousand people ki- soldiers get killed, and I say, well, at that point we should start fighting, right? If I write that article, right, and people, there'll be all the fingers will point at me. You're a traitor. You're Chinese propagandist. You're right. So I'm not allowed to talk about that. And honestly, I don't need to, right? I can just say. As an analyst, at that point, this is what the the, the leadership at the Taipei, whoever this whoever is in government at that point, she or she will likely see sue for peace, which means unconditional surrender. Yes. Okay. So uh, you answered my question. Basically, the way that they keep you from saying these things is that if you say them. They call you a Chinese propagandist or some kind of traitor. Right. That's the that's the way it's enforced. It's a little bit like in the U.S. Until recently, it, I think the dam is kind of breaking over time. But for a long time, if you pointed out deficiencies in the U.S. policy toward Ukraine, then they would call you a Russian spy or something like this. Even you know, even if you're you're Tucker Carlson or Donald Trump, they would call you a Russian spy if you point out. You know, right. the U.S. is maybe not doing the smart thing in Ukraine. Right. Okay, so the, I think that maybe gives some idea of the general landscape of opinion and, and, and public discourse in Taiwan. Let me just switch now and ask the following question. So imagine that you're in a, maybe you're at like a panel discussion at a university or some think tank in Taiwan. And you're there on the panel, and then there's some other experts, maybe some military analysts, some actual military people. Could you then have a realistic discussion about how a war might go with China? Well, a lot of these, uh, well, the, the military, right? The they're, they're never going to, if, if they speak in public, they're never going to be honest about things, just because it's. It's their job on the line. Right? They're gonna stick to the party line and say, "Well, we will we'll fight to the last man. We will, we will. I don't know. Like, we will not lose, right? Things like that. The United States will come to our defense. That, that's the usual talk you see from these, from the military and also institutions and and voices paid by the government. And unfortunately, these these voices, these propaganda, they're being featured." They're being quoted by international media all the time. They like just yesterday I saw a report on Financial Times quoting a Taiwan national security official as saying that United States aircraft carrier wouldn't be threatened by, by China. And that's all a propaganda. The China's the anti ship or it's a missile that can, they, 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 they don't pose much of a threat. I, I saw like, that. I saw that FT article as well, and I was kind of astonished because even the in the U.S. war games, lots of carriers are destroyed. <laughs> well, in, I, I will, in, yeah, I will, I will, well, I will speak very frankly here. That report, the person who wrote that report is a Taiwan government propagandist. She cited Taiwan government propaganda as a fact. And if you look at the research, supposedly research that had been done behind it, Sorry, I saw that report. I saw that report came. I saw that article came out months ago. It uses a video game, the same video game I play. Okay, yes. and the person who did who you did that simulation, he did not know what he's doing. He did yes. not know how this game actually worked. Okay, I can do. I can. I can give you a better scenario. You can make modern operation scenario right now. Yes. Okay. This is just, this is just completely ridiculous. They they they, they cited a video game simulation, a, a poorly executed uh, simulation. And that person is paid by Taiwan's, uh, the, they call the IMBSR, Institute of National Defense Research, something. That institute is a, is a, is a joke. No one takes it seriously in Taiwan. It's, a, it's, it's paid by the Ministry of National Defense. And the, rep- the research, the report came out of it, they're, com- they're just complete joke. There's no value, no nothing. It's just, it's just. I, I, I don't even know where to begin. Okay. Well, let me yeah. modify my scenario a little bit for you. Right. So, 
maybe the panel happens and the right. military people, they, they feel they have to kind of toe the line. So they, they say yes. some things that maybe are not realistic. But then later you go out to dinner with them and you're having a drink at the restaurant. Is there a sense then in private that they have a realistic idea of how the war would actually proceed? No, because in Taiwan's military, the higher you go, right, the higher ranks you are, the less likely you are going to tell truths about things on the ground. The more detached you are from things on the ground. This is across the military. This is that that I'm sorry to say that the, the system doesn't produce the best people and it's very tough. It's usually the as it's usually the most incompetent, the most incapable people that are being promoted in Taiwan's military. And it's, it's getting considerably worse in the last several years because of the politics, because of the DPP government. And also, this is not a thing in Taiwan. So, so the, you know, the, the senior generals, they're never going to go on in, in media interview. They're never going to debate with outside observers. This is just not, not their thing. Their thing is public relations, uh, propaganda. They have a pre-designed setting where they show you, well, this is our new artillery, this is our new tank, this is our new whatever, right? Look at this shiny, big shiny object, right? Look at this whatever program that we're putting out and just write good thing about us. This, this is Taiwan. So... Do you think in their internal planning, for example, in hmm. figuring out how much of the budget should go to hardening the hangars where their planes are parked or, you know, dispersing planes throughout the island? I, I mean, all of these things, you would think they need at least some realistic sense of the military technologies and how the war would go in order to just even plan their defense correctly. Do, do you think they're up to that? No, because whatever they have been, they have been studying, they have been doing, right? It doesn't change the decision making at the very top. That's why that's why President Tsai made a decision to buy new F sixteen in twenty nineteen. That's in twenty nineteen, like after a decade of like at at the point where we already knew the number of jets don't really matter because they are not going to be able to take off. So you buy new jets, it's completely useless. Just because the wrong way is going to get crater, right? And you're not going to have planes, uh, jets to be able to take off. You're not going to have wrong way for them to take off, nor land, so they can refuel, rearm. It's just not going to be. But she made a decision in 2019. Why? Because she was very unpopular in, in early 2019. So she used this arms sale as an opportunity to boost her own popularity. They, they made a whole propaganda about it. They, 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 the DPP, they issue like, like DPP branded flight jackets, right? With F-16V and, and DPP on it, right? As if any of these politicians ever serve, ever, ever serve their military service. Very few of them don't, right? It, it's just like they, these politicians, right, these DPP politicians wear these jackets and then and, and lining up for a photo op. It's just it's completely ridiculous. So on, on the U.S. side, because among U.S. hawks, there's, uh, you know, quite a lot of thinking about this war and how the U.S. should prepare for this war. There are lots of ideas about how the Taiwanese should buy more anti-ship missiles and maybe spend less on their own large ships, which will be destroyed at the beginning of the war. Maybe, maybe spend less money on F-16s. There, there's a fair amount of creative strategic and tactical analysis about what Taiwan should do from the U.S. side that I can read. And, and that is actually fairly realistic. So, so those people who write those reports have at least a moderately realistic, I think, view of the capabilities of the Chinese weapon systems. But it sounds like from what you're saying that that kind of analysis is maybe being produced by American think tanks, but not by Taiwanese think tanks. Oh yeah, these, I, I, I know where, I know who, who, the kind of voices you're talking about, which is in the, in the US, uh, when you talk about Taiwan's defense, of course, you heard people saying, 
on the U.S. side, Taiwan should buy more asymmetric weapons. Taiwan should buy more weapons that uh, platforms that we think are going to be of use compared to what Taiwan is buying right now. But if you look at what the substance, right, they're, they're advocating sea mines or anti-ship, buying more M- harpoon missiles, like stingers or javelins. Well, for number one, the Taiwan is already buying a lot of these stuff. And number two, these things alone, they're not going to fix the overall defense picture, the very, very green defense picture that Taiwan is seeing right now. There's no magic bullet, right? A harpoon missile is not is not a magic bullet. You're not you're not going to trade one Chinese aircraft carrier with one harpoon one harpoon missile. I'm just so sorry. This is not going to happen. But this these a lot of these US experts, they, they make it sound like there is a magical solution to this. There's just no. And I can go into very, I can go into every detail why all of these supposedly fantastic asymmetric weapons or tools, they're really not the not the magic not not, not the fix fixes that you think they are. In fact, I don't think they're gonna change the the underlying balance at all. It's basically, I think the issue should be Taiwan's military needs a fundamental reform in institutional level. That should be done first before we talk about weapons, platform, hardware. Okay. So it sounds like, I, I, by the way, I'm not claiming that the U.S. analysts are realistic, but at least some of them, some of the the reports I've read, they at least have a reasonably realistic sense of what the Chinese weapon systems can do. They're not pretending that the Chinese weapon systems are not going to work. So, so then they're trying to come up with some strategy by which the asymmetric strategy by which the Taiwan Taiwanese can at least, you know, maybe not fully defend themselves, but at least make themselves more uh, of a threat to the Chinese invasion. So, but let me ask you the following question. So given the maybe unrealistic propagandistic view of things, is there any chance that a Taiwanese politician could declare unilaterally, declare independence from China sometime in the next 10 years? Could that actually happen? No, the major part, the major politicians that we have, we, we, we have seen in the next, in the next election, the Lai Ching, the uh, Ke Wenzhe, Hou Youyi, then that even Lai Ching, he's not a Taiwan independence advocate. He's just not. He's like wh- whoever told you that the lie is pro independence probably doesn't understand what lie actually is, what his background, what he's in actually. Uh, just not uh, what well, the jewel of independence is just not longer. It's just no longer a thing. In which is is it, ironic because that's actually what a lot of Taiwanese wanted. They want to push to a left direction, right? They want to assert, they want to reform, they want to reform, change Taiwan's constitution and even country name, and to push for actual membership in the United Nations and other international organization. That that has very strong public support, right? All of these de jure independence agendas, but the DPP, they especially under Tsai Ing-wen in the last decade. This is not their thing. They 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 talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They didn't even want to change Taiwan's sports team, the name of Taiwan's sports team, right? It's called Chinese Taipei, and they have been they have been uh, movements to change petitions to call to 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 change it to Taiwan, but the Thai government didn't support that. Why? Because they didn't want to actually do the thing. They don't want to. Actually, face the backlash, the internet, the the consequences of do, of making any of such move. They are all about talks domestically. Okay, sorry, so for these, my yeah. for my listeners, Lai is the DPP candidate right. who would replace Tsai Ing Wen if DPP yeah. wins the next presidential election. And you're saying even he would be careful. He even even he would not probably cross. Xi Jinping's red lines and 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 cause some action on the right. part of the, the mainland. 
Well, for by myself as a man of faith, I don't think the China has they see things as a, like like red lines here and there. I think they have very clear agenda, which is to unify Taiwan by one way or another. This is their goal. This they they already said it right. As for what Taiwan does in the meantime, in in before, I think they they really see that as secondary. So whoever told you that that the CCP, the, the PRC has this red line here or there, or there's just something that Taiwan does or say that that the POA will attack the next hour. I don't think that's saying. I I don't think that re- that's really the case. I think China they have their own timetable. Right, so even if Lai Qingde, if, if if he gets elected, right, and if 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 I'm wrong, and he stick to his, he put his word, he puts the well, actually he did, he never say those things, but let's say that he moved to change the name of the country, like like reform the constitution and stuff. I don't think there will be the catalyst to an invasion. I think that's just going to be, I th- I think China just they will stick to their timetable, their whatever plan that they have already made. Right, just because they don't, they don't want to react to Taiwan's domestic internal politics. I see. Well, that okay. So that's interesting. So, so you don't think there are red lines, and you think that they have a very no. definite plan that they're following. The, no, the, the CPC. Right. In fact, I think the the only red line that they actually have is with regard to Taiwan's relation with others, like the United States or Japan or. The international community. In fact, you see, you see that during Pelosi's visit last August, right? So, so, so that's one of the things that they didn't like. So, if you if you cross that, and then we're going to show you the we're going to retaliate with certain measures and stuff. But that's toward the United States. That's not toward Taiwan domestic politics. Okay, but I so what you just clarified though. I think if I understood you, you said yeah. there is something the United States could do to trigger yes. a conflict, but not not internally within Taiwan. Right. Because China, they they see the United States as behind as the driving force behind everything happening in Taiwan. Right? Like you can call it a conspiratorial mind, a mindset, but this is what they say. They think whatever happened in Taiwan domestically, that's because someone's behind. That's because United States behind it. That's 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 their their thinking. That's their mentality. And, right? and so, you would say that's not realistic. That that really nobody can predict who's going to win this next election. Is that is no? That of course, mean? yeah, of course. They they they, they, they did you not, within Taiwan, like people always like, speculate. Oh, the, the, the United States favors liking the United States favors who? Nah, this is just not going to be the case. Okay. The the Biden administration's policy to a Taiwan is so passive, so reactive, so they I don't think they even they even care, right? Okay, so so yeah, there's no CIA, not going to be any CIA intervention in the election in favor of one candidate over the uh, over the other. Oh, I know that I I know the kind of guy that they 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 send to Taiwan, right? They're not going to. They don't even speak Chinese. How can they influence election there? I'm sorry. Well, say. okay. L- let me ask you a related question. Do you think the color revolution in Hong Kong was at all, even in part, stimulated by U.S. intelligence services? No, there's no evidence of that. The U.S. intelligence community, the CIA, that is just name it. It's not capable of organizing anything of that sort. You see, they, they, they're just not. Sorry to say. And here you're speaking specifically about Hong Kong and Taiwan. I'm, I don't know. Do you have an opinion about whether Maidan in 2014 in Ukraine what had anything to do with U.S. intelligence services? I don't. I think the development is in Ukraine since before and after 2014. I think they had something to do with the United States. However, they had the, the, the driving forces, the, the influences didn't come from intelligence community, so to speak. By intelligence committee, we're talking about those three later agencies, um, which really didn't, at least from my reading, I'm not a Ukraine expert. I think the, the driving force behind were the Western U.S. influences 
that supported the pro-Western part of Ukraine to to divide, to to push back to 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 those anti-Russian kind of forces and voices within Ukraine. The Western these Western policies and Western resources empower them to an extent. And I don't think those were from the intelligence community. I think a lot of those were just from the civil society. And also, you see, and I, and I, I know if, if I name names here, it's probably going to be controversial, but National Endowment for Democracy, right? And a lot of these uh, organizations, these funding from the U.S., but that's what, they, that's what a lot of people in Ukraine wanted. They wanted these Western influences, and that's what, what, what this is driving force behind them. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my model of this kind of thing is, obviously there is popular local support for these things, and then there may be some resources you know, that are funneled to them through things like NED. By the way, NED is a three-letter <laughs> U.S. Right. agency and very tightly associated with the CIA. So in in the case of my dad, many people, you know, would point to specific incidents where there were snipers firing into the crowd at my dad. And there, there's, a, there's a long discussion about really who were those snipers and were they actually, you know, perhaps operatives put there by Western intelligence right. agencies. So th there's a long history there, but we don't have to go into that. Right. Right, um, and I'm not I'm not an expert on Ukraine anyway. Right, but you um, you think that Taiwan elections are not something that the U.S. is going to have any particular in influence on? The United States could play a rule if they if the administration uh, desires so, right? But I just don't think I just don't think uh, it's going to happen. I just don't see that. And by judging by the current lined up of, of candidates. Right, I don't think the U.S. Has a, has a preference one way or another. Okay, if the KMT candidate wins, do you think that the situation will cool down significantly across the strait? Well, on the one hand, if on the military, on on, a, on the fundamental side, things are going to keep are just going to go a, along the current trajectory. The China is they're they're still going to modernize. Continue modernizing, expanding, improving the, the the POA, and preparing for the capabilities to overwhelm Taiwan. That's just going to keep happen. So the military imbalance is just going to continue growing, no matter who's who's elected president in Taiwan. Yeah. So I... even even KMT, even uh, if you, if you look at the history during Mind Joe, previous president Mind Joe's term, the K previous KMT president. The number of ballistic missiles that China, that China deploy uh, across the Shui, aiming at Taiwan, they increase by by significant number from 2008 to 2016 during Mind yeah. Joe's turn, turn. At a time when people saw crossing relation was great, was was at its best, right? Mind Joe was very was very friendly to a, to the mainland and everything. They, 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 the, the POA, the, they, they're just going to do things that they, they, they wanted to do. Yeah, they're no, I, I, I agree with you yeah. completely. The buildup is not going right. to depend at all on yeah. who is the president of Taiwan or which party is in power. Some explicit manifestations of, you know, intimidation may decrease, right? If it's, if it's, you know, a more conciliatory right. EMT president, right? That's all I meant by that. But the, the right. basic power dynamics are not going to change at all. I think even even those behaviors that those flights and naval activities around Taiwan again th th this is a speculation but I think the POA is going to continue doing those. Why? Yeah, I think be it's like a ratchet. Yeah. They don't they don't once they turn it up they don't turn it back down. But possibly with a KMT president they won't keep maybe they'll turn it up at a lower yeah. rate in terms of just pro actual provocations. Uh, well, it's very hard to define what a, a provocation is in terms of these activities. They, there is in the international media and in the in the international discussion, you could, you kept hearing this word about Taiwan's air defense identification zone. You see all these reporting about 
China flies how many jets into Taiwan's air defense ADIZ? Well, I'm sorry to tell you this. The ADIZ doesn't have a standing in international law. That's what Taiwan says. It's it's it, it, it's it's all ADIZ. That's why it claims it has no international, it has no legal basis in international law. Yeah, it's, no, it's, I I understand this point, and and for the listeners, and, I think right. The ADIZ even extends over China, so, so, yes. so that, yeah, so so just some routine operations of Chinese military planes could be said to quote violate Taiwan's defined self defined ADIZ. So that these particular things are just just propaganda, but but firing a missile over Taiwan is maybe not propaganda. Right. Right? that's pretty aggressive. Right, right. That the the missile test last year, last August, that was definitely definitely new, definitely very. Very pro, very provocative. However, the the air and naval activities, most of the air and naval activities that we have been seeing now, right? I think they're going to continue. Number one, China's military has grown to such an extent they feel they are powerful, mm -hmm. which they they actually are. They're just flexing is their muscles, right? That's what you do when when you build out your. You, you, when you, when you, when you've been working out for months, for years, right? You build out your, your muscle and you try to show it off. That's just what it is. Right. So, so maybe we can actually just get to the main issue and, and just talk about how you project things to develop in the next, say, five right. years. So, do you think that there's any hope of a peaceful, political negotiated reunification? I mean, maybe at gunpoint, but still peaceful? Is that, is that possible? Judging by the current Taiwan politics, the trajectory, I think that's going to be hard because without, without a decisive military defeat, Taiwan's politics, Taiwan's public opinion, they're never going to concede to China. And they don't want, they just, people don't want to. People want to keep their independence. They want to keep their, they have their own, they feel they are superior. They feel they are special. They feel they're different. So they want their, their government to themselves to, 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 to say no to China. Right? I mean, that's fine. That's, that's, that's what Taiwan's people wanted. But on policy, on actual policy area, right, defense and security, the part, their politicians just don't deliver. Not preparing for, for because you you need to prepare for war. If that's if, if that's why you uh, that it, 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 if you want to keep that, if you want to keep China from getting what it wants. Right. So you you don't see any plausible scenario in the next five years where there's any kind of negotiated peaceful reunification. No, unless unless there is a military conflict, there is a basically a war. And can you do you have any opinion about the timetable that Xi Jinping has? Is there any kind of deadline for him to actually push things forward? Right, that I don't know because I don't. I'm not Xi Jinping. I'm not. I'm not a Politburo member. Anyone who tells you otherwise, say there is a timetable, there's a timeline, there's a deadline, there is a deadline, 2027 or 2030, 20, whoever tells you that, it's just making it up. Because Xi Jinping, they are not Xi Jinping. They're not the member of the Central uh, Military Commission. They're not a member of the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party. Who are you? Who who are they to tell you this? They're just they're just nobody, right? However, you can look at the military balance. You can look at the fundamentals, the technological, the economical competitions, and everything. And you you can say, well, it's now twenty twenty three. China has this much capability. The Taiwan and the U.S. are at this such level. So they have some percentage of uh, some uh, level probability of success is, is here, right? Versus if we wait, if we wait another three year or five year, the China is going. This gap is just going to grow larger between Taiwan and China, and they're just going to get more, more and more stuff, more warships, more planes, more 
sales fighter jets, more satellites in the space, they are going to have even higher ch- chance of success against Taiwan and the U.S. Right. So time is on their side. That's that's from Xi Jinping from China's perspective, and I think that is why they're in no rush because the, because time is on their side. They are seeing great progress in all in most of the com- domains of competition. So why should they rush things, rush to a war now? They don't need to. Now that being said, yeah, that being said, I think at some level when when the imbalance reaches such an extent, and when there is like an international, when circumstances, when events, when we have certain events that pro- compel. The PRC, the, the Beijing, to make a decision, to make a move. Be this imbalance of power will motivate them to go on a war. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. agree with your analysis. I mean, to me, it seems very likely, barring some really radical change in both U.S. and Taiwanese politics, the advantage will just continue to accrue to the PLA. Yeah. And so they're in no hurry to right. act. And so I, it doesn't seem likely that anything's going to happen in the near term. Well, the, the, well, if there are some international developments, circumstances, event unfolding, then they could be compelled to, to make such a move. It's right. just that we don't know. Well, if, if NATO starts fighting Russia in Europe, they might take advantage of that, right? And just go because even though even though they're not, they, the, the, the ratio of forces, it, could he get even better in the future for them? That circumstance where U.S. would be distracted, NATO would be distracted, obviously that would, might be attractive to them. But, but barring some special event like that, it seems like it would be smarter for them to just let their advantage continue to accrue. Well, Ukraine is already, even, even without actually getting into a war, this whole Ukraine war already exposed just how unprepared, how under capacity the United States is in, in an actual war, in an actual military confrontation. You see all these reports, there the, are all the reports out there already, how the munitions, the missiles, they just don't deliver in the U.S., they don't have the capacity. They they burn through their whole stockpile of javelins or stinger in five year, ten year stockpile in in a matter of a few months, and they can't replace them. And that that's the underlying problem of the U.S. defense industry, right? And even in the U.S., you have only seen scattering reports about this. There's there's in, in, it's not a big public discussion. Yes, yeah, so. So you know, and I know, because we're following this, <laughs> yes. the U.S. industrial base and military industrial base is very hollowed out now, and they, yeah. it's implausible that they could fight an extended war in the Pacific, given the current infrastructure base. But right. as you say, uh, this whole thing is suppressed in the United States, too. It's not really discussed very much in the United States. Do you think in the at the top levels of Taiwanese leadership that they're not following this? They don't realize their big ally, which they want to come to their aid, actually doesn't have a lot of, you know, military equipment stored away that are ready to help. The, uh, the politicians, both K- KMT and DPP, and even Ko and Zhe, I think, they fundamentally do not understand the, the the weaknesses, the the weaknesses in position, the weaknesses in power, the United States is currently experiencing. They are still seeing United States as the great as the superpower of the late twentieth century. They're stuck in nineteen nineties. Okay, they have not seen how much, how much the, the the industries, how much being hollow out in the U.S., how many structural fundamental problems the United States has, the lack of labor, the lack of skilled people, the the uh, the how overpriced everything, all the military equipments are. They have not seen any of that. The the Taiwan politicians, 
for them, the U United States is like is like God. If God is on our side, we are fine. We are we are going to be okay. <laughs> that 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 this is the reality of Taiwan, right? Both KMT, DPP, this is their worldview. Right? As long as I have as the United States favors us, Taiwan is going to be okay. Yeah, as long as the United States come to our defense. Well, I'm sorry, but the United States is, it's, it can barely keep out, it can barely stand on its own. So you're you're not detecting any change in that perception, even among, say, younger politicians. There's not a realistic understanding of the current balance of power. Right. And well, I, I can go into some detail. Of the uh, of the perception and the reality, the gap between perception and reality. I mentioned about the Ukraine, ab ab about the harpoon missiles. In the U.S. community, the think tanks and the company analysts they they think things like harpoon missile is the magic weapon that Taiwan needs. So if we if we sell more harpoon missile to Taiwan, right, and it's an as a magic weapon, and Taiwan can keep POA at bay. Right? Well, I have, a, I have bad news for you. The harpoon missile that Taiwan buys from the U.S., they are of the non-extended range version of the harpoon missile. Their range is like 140 kilometer, whereas the Chinese anti-ship anti missiles these days, the YJ-18 or YJ-12, they go for like 300, 400, even 500 kilometer. Harpoon missile, I'm sorry to say, is an outdated piece of technology that has not been updated. That has not been that has not been able to keep up the development that internationally for the last several decades. And 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 guess how much harpoon the United States is selling Taiwan these harpoon missile? The 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 latest price, I think, that the the, the arms sale that was announced a few months ago. Uh, if you divide it by the number of missiles, it was like 4.5 or 5 million per harpoon. Well, Thai, so Taiwan is buying harpoon missile for something like 5 million. Now, guess what? The comparable missile, so that's not even compared to the better ones that China has, the YJ-18, the YJ-12. That's compared to the the older one that China has, right? It's the, the ones that, it's called the C-802. Right, that has been in service since the eighties or nineties, right? Similar to the harpoon, it has a similar speed, similar range. It's basically a copy of harpoon. Or uh, China sold C A zero two to Venezuela. I think that was in twenty seventeen, for per missile price of like three hundred thousand U S dollar. So Taiwan is buying the same, is buying similar performance missile from the United States. A ten times the price. What China is building? How is this sustainable? <laughs> and how how is this how is this asymmetric? I ask I ask these U.S. analysts. I ask these think tank people. I say, you think that the harpoon missile is the major weapon in Taiwan that that you can offer to Taiwan? But at what price? Five million per missile, right? And and then the response that you would get is usually along this line. Well, one harpoon missile can sink one Chinese destroyer or aircraft carrier. That's worth it. I mean, come on. Let's, let, let's just stop being childish. You are not going to trade one Chinese destroyer, Type 55 destroyer, Type 50 destroyer, or even an aircraft carrier with one harpoon. Okay? Now, those ships, they're not go never going to get into the range of your harpoon missile. Right, they have air cover. They have a carrier base. They carry an aircraft. They have like those destroyers. They have VOS. They have hundreds of anti-air missiles. Right, they have like closing weapon system. They have electronic warfare. They have your one harpoon is never going to get through those defenses. You need probably not one, but like thirty, fifty, or hundred to 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 saturate their defenses. Right, and at that point you are asking, you 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 you're doing the math, right? Does this does this math mathematically make sense? You spend to to the, 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 and and it doesn't have the range, right? It's 
it's not going to threaten those big big surface warships. They can stay away, far away from Taiwan. But this is just one thing that you see this in Taiwan discussion about Taiwan defense all the time. People were like focus on the United States is this. You can sell Taiwan this, so it can fix Taiwan's problem. Let me just say this: this, this, this is not this is a wrong wrong angle to look at things. You can't fix an institutional institutional problem by injecting more hardware, more stuff. The problem is with Taiwan's military itself. The institution, the organization, the training, the leadership. They're just not on this they're just on this on, on a good base on, on a good fundamental. That everything just need reform. Right. Well, I mean from for the US military industrial complex, Taiwan is a huge profit center, right? So they can sell oh, yeah. they can sell overpriced weapons to Taiwan and US think tanks tend to be funded, heavily funded by the military industrial complex. So you can kind of understand how this works. I guess the one argument I could understand for why the harpoons maybe are still valuable is that, yes, they may be outranged by Chinese anti-ship missiles now, but within the strait to stop amphibious landing craft or an invasion force, obviously they, they do have the range to hit things more or less all the way across the strait, right? So so maybe that's the, the scenario where these would actually come in handy. Yeah, but, but that goes into another question. How are you going to find Chinese warships, Chinese ships, Chinese and even like smaller Chinese amphibious, amphibious vehicle, and amphibious craft, amphibious ships? You need sensors, you need surface search radars, and you need data links. You need command and control to feed data to command firing of these miss anti ship missile in Taiwan. Guess where? Guess where? Guess what's going to happen to those radars, to those sensors, to those command and control data links, to those headquarters? Those they're going to get bombed. They're going to get. They're going to get destroyed by the Chinese. The, the, their ballistic missiles and long range rockets, or anti radiation missiles. That, that's their first priority to to, to knock out Taiwan's uh, C. We call it C four ISR. Right, command, control. Those are the infrastructure they're going to target. So yeah, if you lose those, you you lose your sensor. Whatever number of missiles you have become irrelevant, and that is where you you don't see discussion about. Yeah, I I, yeah. I agree with what you just said. It's a kind of thing that makes me really worried that there isn't some realistic planning going on on the Taiwan side of like what day one would look like and then what happens after that. So that would be very tragic if the military were not competent enough to at least try to do that planning. Well, the, the ta ta geographically, Taiwan is so small that China's their intelligence gathering, right? And they, especially given their huge presence in the space. Mm-hmm. They launch like hundreds of satellites every year, mm -hmm. remote sensing satellites, right? Measurement satellites, signal, signal intelligence satellites, imagery satellites, everything, everything you name it. Like right? they have so many assets from the air, from the space. They know exactly what's going on in this small geographical area, right? Using a using a, a harpoon missile launcher, you put on a truck. Right, it can move around while it is safe. No, it's not. They probably they they probably have satellite like tracking. They have like a uh, the team tracking all these different units, twenty four hours. And they the 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 satellite. So we in China. I don't know the English word for that, but in China, it's called um. At 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 any given spot on Earth, let's say Taiwan, right? How long? Will it be before the next? So a, a, a satellite come, a Chinese satellite come, come across. It takes picture, so it sees where it is on the ground right now. It sees a, a Taiwan missile launcher, right? How long is it going to be before the, the next Chinese remote sensing imagery satellite come uh, come on the same spot again to update the information, update the the position? 
Well, guess 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 how long? It's something like ten to twenty minutes. <laughs> yes. Right. It's years ago that would be an hour, two hour, and a decade ago they don't even have that. They they probably didn't have, even have that capability. These days, it's like in in in, in minutes. They have updated imageries, the updated the location of Taiwan, where Taiwan's、uh, things are. They can track that. They can、uh, you you what you think is safe, they are no longer safe. What you think is is mobile is 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 asymmetric. It's no longer the case because the because just just how far events how things have changed on China's side, right? And but this is the this is not talk about. Right. Yes, I I think, I think increasingly on the American side. So you know, if you go back five or ten years, the Americans didn't want to admit that the DF twenty one actually worked or DF twenty six. But but now that's changed. So the the Americans have a more I think realistic or at least、uh, they're they're being more careful about potentially what they would face in the Western Pacific. But it's it's disheartening to learn that in Taiwan they're they're still not. Realistic about their situation. Yeah, well, I think is if if they face the music, they have to then then naturally the 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 logical conclusion is whatever we have been doing, it's just not working. So we need to change everything. Taiwan's military, the as an institution, they never allow that, right? They're never going to say, "Oh, well, our our whole air force is useless, so let's change something." No, they they're like, you have like hundreds of generals in the air force. They they want to keep their job. They want to keep their position. They want to get they want to get their promotion next year.、Mm -hmm. So they're 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 all of them. They're going to they they're going to. Lie. They're going to make up things that. Oh no, no. We can do. We can. This is not true. We can. Or the navy, for that matter, or the army. That's just the institution. The the institution itself. Is it is not facing is is not、uh, confronting the reality, and the politicians behind them are even worse. Right, like President Tsai. Because she wanted she like in twenty nineteen she wanted to win another turn. So she ordered new F sixteen, or whoever the next president will be, right? And they they will see defense policy as a political tool, a partisan political tool. No one ever took defense, military part as as a, in in a serious term. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let, let, let's think about this. This is us. This is our safety, our security, at stake. Maybe we need to do things that 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 help us survive this war. If a war happened, no, that's not how Taiwan's politicians say. At least not President Tsai. She 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 never shown any commitment, any willingness to take things seriously. Everything is politics. Everything is partisan. Everything that's in, associated with defense and security is 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 for DDP's electoral benefit. At least that's the things I have seen. Over the last several years, well, for Americans who can't believe that things could be so bad, I'll just remind them that when we left Afghanistan, the official estimates from the military and the intelligence services were that the the U.S. backed government could survive there easily for a year after we left. When in fact, it turned out to be more like a month or something, right? So, right,、um, that this is the idea that the military and intelligence analysts can. Deform their analysis for political purposes is 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 true in almost every country. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to say that 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 that. I don't see. I don't think things will change on this because I, I think the United States is what what's been happening because the arms sell because everything has been going on. Think they are they they're not pushing things on the right direction. In fact. What I have been tracking is keywords such as reform, military reform, changes in in organizations, in doctrines, in strategy. Like those are not the things I'm seeing coming from the United States. Right,、uh, you see, you you see some 
vaguely worded statement that、like, to push Taiwan to help Taiwan develop asymmetric capabilities. What does that even mean, right? The, the, the Taiwan soldiers, they, the, the, the army, they don't even train soldiers as competent riflemen. You don't talk about that, but you want to talk. You want to talk about asymmetric. What what do they even entail? Right, the basic competency is not even there. But the United States, the the AIT, right, the Pentagon, the U.S. State Department, they don't want to call. They don't want to call out Taiwan for for these for the, on on this. Right, they're not gonna they're not gonna take it seriously. Taiwan's public, they're just gonna think, well, everything is fine. Everything is the United States is pushing us to the right direction. We just need to buy weapons, right? And and then and then the United States is our back. He will come to our defense. I mean, I mean, th- th- this this is just、uh, it's time to wake up. Yes. Well, Paul, I've taken up a lot of your time. I feel like my listeners will have a much more realistic. Understanding of the situation in Taiwan after all of your comments, so I I thank you very much, and I wish you、uh, a good morning in Tokyo. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Thank、yeah. you very much. Thank you.